afternoon uh, or morning, evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Nomosa Makubo, and I am based at the University of Cape Town teaching art history. It's really wonderful to welcome you to this conversation. Um, and I can't believe it's been 10 years. <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in the company of Gavin Janchis, who is a painter, curator, writer, lecturer. He, he said, I must only say artist and printmaker. But I mean, of course, we all know. <laughs> um, uh, Gavin, you've been artistic director for a number of in in international institutions and artistic director at the Henning Onstead um, Kunst Center in Oslo. And then um, we also have Lisa van Robberg, who is um, professor of visual studies at Stellenbosch University. Her research has focused on critical whiteness and she is currently, I'm um, sorry, my, my, my apologies. She currently works at the intersection of settler colonial studies and new materialism. Then we have Mario Pizarra, who is an art historian and director of the Africa South Art Initiative or ASAI. Um, one of the places that I think is, is such an important space, uh, you know, <laughs> um, for, 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 for contemporary art um, uh, and art discourse uh, in general. Mario is also currently a postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Stellenbosch. All three speakers have played a pivotal role in producing Visual Century, but we also want to acknowledge all the authors and editors who contributed to the four volumes. Uh, to briefly kickstart the discussion, it's, it's been 10 years since Visual Century was published. Um, bringing together many scholars, Visual Century is a compendium of critical analyses and historical accounts of the intricacies of South African art between 1907 and 2007. Its goal, as you put it, Gavin, um, in the preface, was to grapple with the uneven flow of South African contemporary art, to contextualize the relevance of artists and their works to the nation's cultural identity, and to place them in relation to the history of international art. There were so many gaps and distortions um, you know, in art history as a discipline that necessitated a project like Visual Century. Um, and I guess those gaps and distortions are something that resulted in, in younger scholars distancing themselves from art history as a discipline. Um, and not only were there were they imbalances in terms of which artists were included or legitimized, but also the work that there was, there was a lot that needed to be done in terms of who's writing and from which perspective. Um, there was so much work to do then, there remains much to do now. Uh, 10 years on, art writing is not the same. Today, of course, we're sitting here, we know that there are more established back black um, historians, curators, thinkers, and writers than they were then. Uh, people like Nondobe Gondombela, whose meticulous and timely retrieval of the rich works of women artists is opening up new avenues for research. Charlene Khan, whose centering of the African feminist ethos is shifting how we write and engage with women artists and mentor writers. Greer Valley, whose critical work on institutions and exhibition histories is uncloaking the veneer of institutional integrity. Curators like Sam Mvuli and Posha Malaji, who are questioning the taxon taxonomies of art writing, and many others like Tuli Kamete, who is here with us today, who are embracing transdisciplinary work, experimenting with ideas, and in you know, working in a variety of spaces, making spaces to generate and share knowledge and reaching across borders. And then of course, we have organizations like Africa South, uh, South Art Initiative and many others which have produced valuable research on artists who have played a crucial role in shaping our politics, but are often overlooked in commercial circuits. So there are, there are now many avenues to collaborate and reframe research um, and, and writing on the arts that have opened up new questions about the state of art research and writing today. What new roles do institutions play in shifting practice into or back to people-centered processes? How do we further projects, projects like uh, Visual Century? And how do we understand its impact today? I'm certain that you have many questions too, and I'd like to encourage you to post your questions as and when they come up. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, so we will collate, collate these and raise them in the Q&A section of today's program. 
Uh, I also will just mention that I'm in an area that is scheduled for load shedding at 4 p.m. So if I suddenly drop off, please bear with me. I'll try to reconnect again using, using um, other devices. So Gavin, let's start with you. Um, and if you could talk about the genesis of the idea of visual century, uh, why did you see the need for it? Um, how did you go about mobilizing resources? And, and what do you see as the successes uh, or shortcomings of the project? Yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of information. I'll try and be brief, Anna Musa. Um, firstly, also welcome to everyone who has joined in. I see there's over 60 uh, participants. That's very good for a Zoom seminar. Um, I want to start maybe where the project started. I was living in uh, Norway at the time, uh, working at the National Museum, and uh, Madiba came to launch uh, his children's charity. And uh, we had dinner together, and he asked me why I was still in Norway, in Oslo, rather than back in South Africa. And I said I needed something to do. I needed something to uh, come back to. Um, I didn't just want to appear as an exile who came in and told everybody to shift stools and take over places uh, for preventing those who have struggled on the ground uh, to actually have an opportunity. So I was looking for a project and he said, well, come and if you have a project, um, tell us about it and see, we'll see what we can do. And I I talked to the Minister of Culture then and asked uh, if I could visit all the uh, national visual cultural institutions. So I traveled through the country and visited all the museums, uh, all the major museums and some smaller museums to find out what they were doing and whether there was a project that we could in initiate that linked the uh, collections of these museums to tell a story um, about South Africa, because I had realized that during apartheid, the history, the art history was very much an apartheid history. And there'd been some researchers on the ground who had tried to correct that, uh, but there hadn't actually been a major survey of the true contributions of um, black artists um, to tell this historical story. So initially I wanted to make four um, exhibitions, uh, each exhibition telling a, a quarter of a century or 25 years of history. And then if we circulated those four exhibitions around four institutions over a period of a year and a half, we would have four history books, which together would tell um, a story of a hundred years of history. But I very soon realized after visiting these institutions that this was not going to be possible. They had no researchers on the ground working in the institutions. They had no money. They had no proper facility to really work this. And so I was stuck and I thought, well, if I can't make the exhibition catalogs, then maybe make the book. And that's when I decided to reformulate the pro project, applied to the ministry. The ministry gave me some startup money and that allowed me to uh, build a team which included Mario and Lisa uh, and a number of others. Um, and we set about organizing a structure for the publications. Initially, we were thinking of one single book, but we soon realized after we'd done some basic research that this was not going to be possible. And one book became four and uh, a small group of writers became 37. Uh, editors became four, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we set about making a, a series of research projects, trying to find people who would want to join this project and have their research published or help us build some new research material that we could put into the uh, historical timeline. So we did that. And then um, the next thing was to find a publisher. We soon realized that we were running out of money. So we had to go and raise some more money I did that, uh, getting some funds from the US and from Norway and elsewhere. And so we had enough money to actually create the content and do all the research, et cetera. But we, we were looking for a partner publisher. Vitz came in as a partner publisher because part of the condition to Madiba that I had agreed on was this should be an African project. It should have African writers, 
it should have African editors, it should have an African designer, et cetera, and, and a publisher and a printer. We fulfilled most of that with the exception of the printer, uh, but we were looking around South Africa in terms of publishing houses and there were very few who could tackle the project of the scale or willing to tackle the project of the scale to put their money where their mouth was and help us build a true new art history. Uh, Witz was the one that came forward and said, yes, it will come in as a partner. Uh, and that promise was very soon broken. Um, but anyway, we established a working method and I'm sure Mario and Lisa will talk about the, that working method of how to tell a hundred years of history, not necessarily as a single timeline, but as an overlapping sequence of events that build uh, or extend and expand what was already there. Um, and this I think was problematic in many ways because it meant that the book didn't have one singular voice as many art historical books have. It had a multiple of voices which appealed to me because of the time we were in, in which we wanted to celebrate the multiplicity of voices that there was uh, in the country and in our constitution. And we wanted to celebrate that and this book actually reflected that. So we started in 2007, I think it was, and we completed the book in 2010, launched it at um, WITS, a uh, new campus exhibition space, and then at the National Gallery in Cape Town. And then Mario and myself organized two other launches, one in Washington DC in the USA and one in New York. And I launched the book in, uh, in Oslo on two, two separate occasions in two separate venues. And uh, yeah, and the rest is history. Uh, but it wasn't an easy journey. And, and we should talk about that because I think the relationship amongst the team that we had built to form the Visual Century Project, there was a lot of cohesion and of course, a lot of disruption as there is with the project of the scale. But I think the greater difficulty was the project uh, with the project uh, was finding a way to work with the publisher. And that was difficult. But uh, I will stop there and allow some of the others to contribute to that, to that particular historical timeline. Yeah. Thanks so much, Gavin. Um, Lisa, let's come to you. So, I mean, I think um, Gavin sort of pointed us in this direction in terms of the, the methods and methodological issues. So could you speak um, uh, or at least address the issues around the main epistemological and methodological issues um, in the process of making visual century. Um, and in your view, what were the challenges of the chronological um, and thematic organization of the book? So how did the team go about selecting themes and writers? Um, and what are your views on how successful or not that approach was? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Um, Yes, it was difficult because, you know, you you writing this and planning this at a time when just about every uh, element that's involved in the composition of this project, which is art history, uh, the concept of history and the concept of a national art history, have been thoroughly uh, discredited. You know, you mentioned uh, some skepticism uh, from a younger generation of scholars about art history per se which is regarded as a very Eurocentric discipline. I mean, it evolved uh, in conjunction with the nation state. So the concept of the nation state um, as having a particular essence found expression in, in, in art history as a European discipline of the late, late 19th century. And then the, the concept of history encoded in art history is a, is a very Western concept of history as a, as a kind of grand narrative, uh, you know, a kind of messianic story of, of uh, heroic nations fulfilling their destiny, etc. So you have all of these concepts that are encoded in the idea of, 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 of a history. And of course, um, the nation state in a settler colony such as South Africa is, is, is bound to be very fraught and very fractured and 
um, characterized by major, major uh, um, fault lines, etc. Um, so it, it wasn't an easy project, but the fact of the matter is the nation state exists and people will talk about a national art history. It will be taught at schools and at universities. So how does one actually address this, pro uh, this, this problem and produce an alternative art history that would speak to the previous art histories that had been produced while producing a new one. So it's almost like a two, a two, a Janus faced kind of project, one that looks back at the previous art histories and deconstructs them, um, while also looking at the occluded art history that hadn't been addressed under the previous canon, uh, that looks at um, totally alternative kind of methodologies and frames in which to look at both the past and at, at the present. Um, so it had a lot of uh, briefs to fulfill. And of course, then there's the additional thing that, you know, the people that you bring to the table, you want new voices, you want new representation, um, how not to fall back on the same old, same old uh, figures that um, have populated the art world um, and, and served the status quo before. And that's not an easy task. So uh, it involved a lot of discussion and a lot of consultation. We agreed that we did need a history because we need contextualization. Um, that the previous art histories weren't really art histories in the sense that they tended to focus very much on the formal language in that slightly obfuscating romantic kind of style that we associate with formalist art history in which the artist's unique styles were discussed and uh, a, a kind of hidden narrative of a white canon emerging of superior art, et cetera. How do you prov uh, provide a, a history that's a proper contextualization without producing another grand narrative? So we felt we needed that context and we needed that history, but we needed it to come from, from very many mouths. And that's what we tried to do. So um, a lot of uh, writers were solicited. It was at a point where there were very, very few art historians and voices of color available at that point. It's much better now, which makes me feel that we ideally need a fifth volume to come out now <laughs> to not supplement, but no, not supplement either. <laughs> but to, to, I think it would be a fantastic project actually to also cover the intervening years. Uh, it would be really interesting and maybe even to take issue with, with the last batch of histories that came out. But how we dealt with the problem of chronology to not just produce a, a, this kind of, again, a kind of a grand narrative, was to make each volume overlap quite substantially with the, with the vol next volume, so that the kind of contextual concerns that emerge in one's own particular period, uh, like my period covered uh, really the, the African and nationalist years, uh, how to deal with that particular frame um, so that the next person can deal with their particular frame, but in such a way that it overlaps and doesn't periodize um, strictly so that students don't get this impression that art history in South Africa happened in four distinct phases, you know, um, but also so that the particular thematics of that particular period can be dealt with thoroughly. And we therefore decided that the approach would largely be thematic, but that the themes would be identified that belongs in a particular chron uh, uh, chronological period. So that, for instance, again, if I can use my own example, because it's the one I know the best, there would be the official Afrikaner nationalist canon of high art being produced, but contextualized and framed within its uh, particular political history. But you'd also have the artists in exile, you'd have the informal art centers that hadn't received proper coverage before. Uh, you'd have uh, discourses that were prominent at the time, properly deconstructed, such as the discourse of primitivism, et cetera. Uh, so this was the way we went about kind of providing a history that wouldn't just be a sweeping survey, but that would provide also depth as well as this kind of panoramic look over an entire uh, century. Whether we succeeded or not, uh, we've had criticisms. Some of the criticisms uh, were, were valid. Some of them um, I found not so valid. I know that there were critiques, for instance, that 
there wasn't particular chapters that dealt with feminism or feminist art history or specifically women's perspectives. We had discussed that and decided against that for reasons that I still adhere to, that we didn't want to corral women who played a very prominent role in South African art history, I think most of us would agree, into a kind of a separate uh, type of um, crawl, as it were, um, but that we would raise feminist concerns as and when they arose in relation to particular issues. Um, but I do think that it's relatively successful. I do think it's certainly better than anything else out there. And um, I'm very glad that it's there. We use it in, in our teaching. Um, of course, universities and schools don't necessarily teach national art histories anymore. But precisely because we have quite specialist and highly ac academically viable studies, they're still very useful at a tertiary and secondary level, school level, I think. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, Mario, let's turn to you, um, you know, in thinking about the editorial model and how it worked in practice. You know? So you had to work with many writers and artists. Um, so, you know, just to give us a, some reflections on that process. But you've also, you also, you've also been the director um, of ASAI for years. And uh, so, I mean, I think it would be good to hear what impact you think that Visual Century has had on the work of ASAI. What do you see as the challenges and limitations of the project uh, in terms of its intended aim um, to be accessible to a wide audience? Thank you, Namusa, and uh, hello to everyone who's here this afternoon with us. Um, I think, you know, I, I still remember I met Gavin when um, Gavin was the director for that project that wasn't a project, uh, Cape uh, 7, Cape Africa Platform, the Biennale that wasn't a Biennale. Um, and yeah, I, I remember having a walk with him in Kirsten Bosch at the time that he was struggling with this issue of the museums not being able to implement um, the model that he had in mind with the, the exhibitions. And I'm, I'm grateful to him for having had the faith in me and bringing me in in, in quite a strategic role because, you know, I'd, I'd done a, quite a bit of writing, but I've never managed a project on this scale. Um, I've never really, you know, performed a, any significant editorial role before. Um, so it, it's, it's been Visual Century on a personal level was very important for me in terms of my development. And Namusa, as you suggest, it's also in, in a way, um, influence the way that I've been working with the side, particularly the idea of um, coming up with themes and commissioning writers um, and working closely with writers. Um, but I think just to stop myself from saying too much, I've just made some very brief points. Um, not, not very visual, I'm afraid. Uh, I actually wanted to just print it out, but because of load shedding, I couldn't print it. So then I decided, let me just capture it on PowerPoint. <laughs> Otherwise I'd have to read my own handwriting which these days is totally illegible. So let me just see, I just need to share my screen. Okay, this is very brief. Okay, I think firstly, we've, we've spoken about it as a collaborative model. I just wanna talk a little bit about, you know, practically how that works. Because I think what was key to our approach was, you know, we had that first um, meeting for two days at Stellenbosch uh, with Gavin, uh, Lisa, Gillian Carmen, uh, and Tim Kosigoniwe. And, you know, we really constituted the, the initial team um, with four of us acting as editors and, and Gavin as the, the overall director. And we were given the responsibility to each come up with, um, identify the key themes that would fall within the, the, the various volumes, which as Lisa explained, uh, address different timeframes, but overlapping timeframes. So the volume editors would, would draw up the briefs, uh, which would be, we discussed uh, consultatively. And the editors also played a key role in identifying the writers. I think this is quite important because the one thing I learned subsequently was how unusual this approach is. I do think that most books that are out there, people start by choosing writers. And, and writers are pretty much given carte blanche to do whatever they want because they're part of the selling power of the book. I think that often happens. In this case, we really started with the themes. And what was interesting with that was that, you know, 
there were two cases where we um, gave writers two chapters in two different books. And we didn't take that decision lightly, but it was after debating those themes and feeling that those people were actually the best people to address those particular themes. The other thing to say is that, you know, we drew up these uh, briefs, uh, short briefs for writers that had very clear themes, but the writers themselves chose the examples that they discussed. Um, and I think that's also quite important in terms of just the, the plurality of voices that, you know, yes, we were trying to influence the discourse, shape it by prioritizing certain themes, but within that writers had a lot of latitude in terms of where they took their arguments. Then the editorial model itself was also very collaborative. The volume editors had final say in terms of what was happening in their, in their respective volumes, but they also received written feedback from myself and from Gavin. So they had this other layer, and this happened literally for every single essay. And then, for example, Lisa or Gillian or you know, Tembi as the editors, it was then up to them to decide what to do with that feedback that they got. So it was just another level of engagement that was happening, but we didn't confuse the writers by having five voices coming at them. Their communication was with the volume editor. And I think just to say that, you know, mostly the writers responded very well to this because there was a lot of engagement. There were a few cases where people just addressed the brief absolutely spot on first time around and didn't require anything. But in many cases, there was a toing and froing. Um, certainly, I know that in volume three, which I edited, uh, I mean, some writers, there was up to seven or eight different um, drafts that actually happened. But not everybody responded that well. That's, that's almost another whole chapter for one day. We will have a lot of anecdotes to share. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the issues was this issue that we came up against. Uh, sorry, have I just skipped a slide? You can see. Oh, okay, sorry. Just some of the brief challenges from a practical point of view. Uh, quite a few writers just, just stopped responding. I've said many responded positively, but some, I, I don't know, for whatever reasons, you know, you just suddenly didn't get a response. I think we had at least um, seven writers that this happened. And this actually obviously created some setbacks to, to the schedule. Um, and we had one writer, one editor who also went over. Um, the issue of deadlines. Uh, we were very optimistic. I was looking at uh, past correspondence and stuff in, in preparation for this. And we thought we were going to do this in a year to two years. Um, Gavin mentioned earlier that we went to press in 2010. It was actually 2011. Yeah, sorry. It was the end of 2011. It was four years we worked on this project and quite intensely. Um, there were, to my memory, only two writers who actually met the original deadlines. And the slowest one actually came in a year later. Um, there was no contingency budget. We, you know, we allocated money very strictly in terms of paying people. So if somebody had been paid half for giving you half a chapter and then just took another 10 months to give you the rest, we just had to wait. Um, and you know, that, that, that created some, some issues as well. But I think at another level, one of the things that we had to deal with quite a lot was there was some resistance to the project. Um, there were people who feared that we were now being funded by the DAC and we were going to produce an official uh, rainbow version of Esme Berman or something that was going to be, you know, the new gospel of art history. Uh, this really, some people were quite almost hysterical on this point. Uh, writers and artists, actually, uh, in some cases. Uh, on the other hand, we had um, others that felt that, who objected to the fact that we did uh, in identifying writers, use some very established academics as part of the project. I mean, we were very diverse. There were young writers, there were writers at different stages of their career, but we also opted to use people who had a proven track record. And we actually got quite a lot of flack for this uh, from, from some, some of the writers who actually used this as a premise to actually withdraw from the project. So this, this issue of the canon, um, I think just to respond to this, what I've called the fear of the canon, the, as I've explained, the method that we used, you know, we didn't, as the editors, give ourselves this role of saying, okay, you know, these are the 100 artists that are going to appear and these are the 100 works. You know, we didn't behave like the curriculum board or whoever has chosen works for children today at, at, in schools. 
um, you know, there was this dynamic role that was being played by, by the writers in terms of the selections they were making. Um, Lisa spoke as well about the themes that were introduced and, and the fact that we didn't want to, you know, repeat uh, themes that, that were out there. We wanted to find fresh ways of looking at things. And we were also quite aware that, you know, we had kind of had two art histories. We had the, the old white history, and then we had the, the revisionist school that, you know, was exclusively black in terms of inserting um, black artists into South African art history. And in a sense, this was the first time anyone was standing back and saying, okay, well, let's think about land as a theme and how different artists responded to that, regardless of whether they were white or black or, or how those positions may have impacted on how they interpreted those themes. So I think, you know, there was, uh, it was a different kind of moment that we, we were at. Um, I think in terms of the canon, you know, also we, we took a very maverick approach to the idea of 100 years. Uh, you know, if we had done South African art in the 20th century, uh, that would have carried with it, uh, I think, that, that, that weight that, you know, in a way we dodged around. I'm not sure it always worked. We had to spend a lot of time telling people why we had the dates we had, when, to be honest, I think we just wanted to be current. You know, it was 2007, so we, we, we went we rewound 100 years. But I did find myself having to make an argument for 1907. And perhaps in my foolishness, you know, I cited Le Demoiselles, which really got a lot of people very upset because, you know, now our art history starts with Picasso in France. Uh, it was just an example of, you know, this is Europe starting to look towards Africa for its own interests. You know, here we are in 2007. What is our position today in terms of engaging with the continent, et cetera? But anyway, so, so often there were quite uh, interesting responses to, to the, the dates that we chose. Um, in terms of whether we how we succeeded, um, I just want to speak really from my own perspective as the editor of volume three. Um, I think that there were two overriding objectives I wanted to get across. The one was that I really wanted us to move beyond this idea of resistance art in the way that it's been instrumentalized as an idea, images of people str struggling against the police, et cetera, um, and to look at how resistance manifested in many, many different ways. The other thing was I wanted to challenge this orthodoxy of, you know, that artists were all united in their activism against the uh, apartheid, which, you know, as anyone who, anybody who was active at the time knows was a complete myth. The South African art world was as divided and, uh, as any other aspect of uh, any other sector in society. Um, I'm just mentioning this and also, you know, in terms of, my own chapter as, as a contributor, because as editors, we contributed chapters as well. You know, I wanted to question the orthodox view of the cultural boycott in terms of the idea that South Africa had no engagement. I highlighted the fact that, you know, there were 29 international exhibitions during the period of the cultural boycott, all facilitated by the state. Okay, so I think my main start. point here is that I actually feel like none of this actually has made any difference. Um, I don't think it's affected anything. And this brings me to my last point about access. We wanted the book to be accessible, both in terms of writing, but also in terms of reaching audiences. The book was expensive to produce. Uh, distribution was very problematic. I'm still finding people who've never heard of Visual Century. It's not in most schools. It's not in most public libraries. And I feel that the time has come now, 10 years later, I think Wits has made their money now. Uh, they've sold most of the books. And I think it's time now that we actually release the chapters online for free so that we actually can contribute to that circulation of knowledge and actually make the impact that unfortunately it looks like, you know, we couldn't make in terms of the physical copies. We appealed to the DAC to assist in that distribution. They didn't step up. But I think there's another way to do it, which is to do it online. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Marie. I mean, you, you're raising a lot of questions, uh, you know, that really sort of give us the context or one can say bleak context of publishing. Um, you know, since 10 years, no one has attempted to do something, a project of this scale. But also it's very difficult because we either work with academic publishers or we turn to self-publishing, which is in itself a very expensive feat. Gavin, I wondered if you had some reflections in terms of you know, the landscape in, in publishing 
I have I have quite a few, and I, I just wanted to just pick up something you've just talked about then. That this project, which actually is the biggest research project on the African continent, there's nothing else like it. Not that I'm trying to blow my own trumpet here, but just a week ago, Fiden uh, launched its book on Africa, 1882 to the present. And in that entire book, there is not one sentence that actually mentions visual century. That's how Mario said. Historians do not know this, even though there are historians <laughs> writing for this Faden book who are in the visual century. Their voice is in, the, uh, in, the, in this book, but they themselves have not mentioned visual century. So there's something wrong there. And I think the reason for that is that we worked with a publishing house that had no relationship to the art world. It did not understand how the art world uses this material, how it works, how it functions, how you actually disseminate information from books through the systems of the art world, through local galleries, through writers, through uh, uh, education systems at university level, at school level. It never understood this. In fact, it had very poor networking facilities to the art world, and it had very poor networking to the then available digitization of information. Uh, the little podcast that we played right at the beginning of the session, for example, when I made them, I made four of those. I hired a professional team to make me four small adverts that they could use. Vitz did not know how to use this material. We had to go out and actually explain to them how you use a podcast to let the world know what you're doing. They did not understand it. And I don't know if they do it today. I think that's that relationship was perhaps the best, the worst choice that we could have made, but we had to make it as we had promised uh, the cultural ministry, we would make a project using African resources. Um, so we were stuck with a, with a publishing house that really doesn't understand the art world, even though it wants to get into publishing art books. Uh, you know, I go to, uh, Lisa and myself went to an exhibition in uh, The Hague, which was on South African sculpture. The organizers of that exhibition could not get copies of this book into their, into their bookshop. This was a museum that had an exhibition and they could not get copies on time, when, even though they had written months ahead because we had we informed them and they used the timelines from the, the visual century because the, 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 the four timelines that we created for the visual century are quite impressive in terms of their scale and their and what they produce but they did not um, they, they simply looked at the timelines and said this timeline is relevant to the making of an exhibition around South African sculpture so that we can locate where and when art, art was made in, in relation to the different styles of sculpture being produced in South Africa. That, was a, that happened, I think, within a year and a half after the publication uh, was launched. So th there was this problem, and I think there is a question about working with publishing houses that do not understand the art world but want to get into it because there's some kind of money business, <laughs> money that they can raise from it. Uh, so Mario's suggestion that we just release this information out into the world for free is perhaps the best way because I do not believe that Vitz can do this. Uh, I think they will most probably look at it and say, oh, we're going to lose money. And they don't understand it. It's not about the money. It's about the information that inspires people to make the next big project. When we launched this book in Joburg, I was asked this very question about almost by historians, how dare you make this book? I'm not, an, I'm not a historian, I'm an artist, I paint and I write a little bit, but I am not a historian, not qualified as a historian. Why did a person who was sitting in Norway at the time write a major or initiate a major piece of historical research? Why do South Africans not do it themselves? And I don't believe it's just a question of money. If I could find the money, others could find the money. I'm absolutely certain about this. It's just about, having networks and working within those networks to make these things happen. So I don't see why there is no follow-up on the invitation to follow up that was in my editorial uh, um, preface to each volume. 
I invited everybody to please follow up on what is in this volume and write. And I don't know if that has been done, but it appears it hasn't. Mm -hmm. You know, um, on, on the point of releasing the content for free, Catherine Smith agrees. Yes, release the content for free. As a contributor, I fully support this. Um, but Philippa says, before you release it for free, encourage all auction houses and commercial galleries to acquire copies for their libraries and offices. Um, and Deirdre is asking, which publisher do you think would be more appropriate? I guess it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a subjective question. Uh, well, that's a question that would require a subjective answer, which I think, you know, we obviously have to talk about the type of publisher rather than one, what specific publisher would be more suitable. Um, but perhaps maybe to come back to Lisa. Lisa, I wanted to come back to a, 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 an article that you published in Third Text Africa, which was titled um, Unsettling the Canon, Some Thoughts on the Design of Visual Century, um, South African Art in, a, a, in Context. Um, in it, you point out that Visual Century's contributors are still largely white, particularly as far as specialization in more remote historical periods is concerned. And so, of course, volumes one and two reflect that uh, what was then seen as scarcity. Um, you also point out that the small up and coming generation of Black art historians tend to focus largely on the contemporary sphere. Um, which is why they appear in volumes three and four. Um, and then of course you, you proceed to say that perhaps this dearth of black art historian speaks more eloquently of the immense white cultural capital obtained through centuries of system systematic racism than any argument or fact presented in the collected um, articles of this four volume um, publication. Could you speak maybe to some of these sort of these difficulties in terms of, you know, I mean, I think Mario sort of pointed out that there were, you know, contributors who who simply just did not respond, but also were 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 concerned about the way in which this, you know, it seemed to start from the the from Picasso, right? So, but can you just maybe speak about this uh, the challenges around representation and um, what your reflections are in terms of, you know, where we are. 10 years yeah. on, um, yeah. what, you know, what, what are your reflections on, on what the landscape looks like today? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm very optimistic that the landscape looks a lot better. You know, at that time, I think when I said that most of the, the, the writers um, of color who contributed to the volume, contributed to the contemporary, um, more contemporary material. Uh, and I think at that point in time, definitely, uh, Almost all the scholars, young scholars, um, were working in contemporary materials. They were, you know, historical stuff wasn't sexy, but that is changing. I'm, um, you know, at at the moment, I'm, I'm going to uh, negotiating with with Ati Joja, for instance, to supervise a PhD um, with him on on more historical materials. And um, I have another student who's also working on, on historical ma materials. And I do think that it's, it's changing. There's a, there's a renewed interest in retrieving a, a history that is, is just waiting really to be excavated, a fascinating history um, in literature, in, in music and in the arts and interdisciplinary history, I feel it needs to be um, definitely much more interdisciplinary. You know, we have a, a fantastic scholar at Stellenbosch University in the English uh, department, Uhura Palafala, who's working on jazz culture and how that has influenced literature. And um, she's going to be co-supervising RT with me. So there's this whole interest in, a, a, I suppose, a kind of an underground culture that was incredibly vibrant, that stretched across uh, what Gilroy called the Black Atlantic, that made for an incredibly um, uh, vibrant and interesting politically and socially phenomenon that is now being excavated with some passion by young authors. And that's why I'm saying that um, it would be fabulous if we could write a, a fifth volume that actually could perhaps even be interdisciplinary because we do need more interdisciplinary kind of histories. Mm. So yes, I'm optimistic. Mm. It didn't look like that at the time. I mean, you know, it was, 
it made sense to also draw on, on authors who had good reputations and who had done a lot of the, the archival work and also use what was available. Mm -hmm. Mario, I, I wanted to uh, get a sense of what your thoughts were on um, institutions particularly. I mean, you know, part of the difficulties in terms of art writing is of course what seems to be a very segregated landscape um, you know, in terms of you know, commercial spaces, but also the research that you've been busy with in, in, with Asai and you know, focusing on, on artists that are overlooked. Um, and so if we were to think of a project like this, it obviously has to address new challenges uh, in terms of you know, how we think about organizations, institutions, and how knowledge is generated, how we're creating new spaces outside of institutions, where the problems lie, um, you know, what are the responses in the institutions uh, that, uh, you know, that we need to pay attention to? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a bit about lately is, you know, who is publishing and, uh, and, and where is it going? Because, you know, I think in terms of academic publishing, I mean, I'm looking at two of the art historians that I respect the most on my screen here. And to be honest, I've read hardly any of your stuff. And it's not because I'm lazy or, or maybe I am, but it's also because of the, the pressures on you and where you publish. The, the pressures on academics to, to publish in peer reviewed journals that are not accessible. Now I've got access personally because I'm a postdoctoral student with, with Lisa, but there's a part of me that almost resists using that access which may sound bizarre, I've got access, why? Because there's a part of me that's just really responds very negatively to this idea of information being only accessible to people that are in the institutions. Um, so I think this is a big problem because there's a hell of a lot of writing going on. Uh, this is a huge subject. I mean, this, this, you know, this could really be a series of webinars. And I, obviously a lot, of, a lot of academics are raising these issues. Um, but you know, it is a problem in terms of just how the universities have developed as businesses and how the, the pressure that has had on you in terms of needing to publish and needing to publish in particular places. Um, so on one hand, there's a whole lot of publishing that is happening. And I don't know to what extent, um, what, I mean, this is a question no one can answer, but what percentage of it would have been published if people were able to slowly develop ideas and put them out in their right time. I know for myself, I have a joke with artists. Sometimes someone will ask me to write about them and I will tell them, if I haven't been thinking about you for 20 years, I'm not ready. Because it takes time to generate ideas that you feel are worth sharing in the public domain, as opposed to you're a brand or, or you know, you're on a career track and you've got to produce this. So I think the academic publishing um, it's a whole thing that, you know, is, is problematic. I was also looking at the fact that, you know, not that long ago, some of the most influential books that came out in South Africa were catalogues that were produced by the Johannesburg Art Gallery, by the South African National Gallery, by the Durban Art Gallery. These institutions are barely publishing now. They occasionally publish. And it's, it's, it has, doesn't have the kind of impact that, that was there. Then you have the galleries that are really on a high and, and they are marketing the artists, they're out at the fairs, they need those books to validate the artists, et cetera. Um, they, I mean, there's tons of that stuff coming out. But when you look at independent writing, like Visual Century, I would say was an independent project. Uh, I think the work that Asai does, I would also put in, you know, into that category. Um, it's a much more difficult field to be operating. You don't have that institutional backing to, you know, get in the resources to get stuff out there. But it just seems to me that, you know, there's more being published than ever before. Um, but where is it circulated? And, and, and this, this, this for me is the biggest challenge. And I, I think if I can I just, just I'll, I'll wrap this up, don't worry, uh, Musa, but just, uh, just a point also on, you know, what Lisa's talking about, the changing profile of writers. I mean, we've been working, um, in the way of commissioning, you know, raising funds to commission writers 
and I've, it's really been phenomenal how the, right, the profile of writers has changed. Um, we're going to be publishing two books in the next year, which all consists of individual essays. Um, and it's not even a deliberate thing. Most of the writers are black. Most of the writers are women. Um, it's, it's, it didn't, doesn't have to be artificially engineered. It's actually a reflection on what's happening in terms of the growing interest uh, in art history, which is a, a fantastic situation to be in. But then again, you know, how is this stuff going to circulate? Or, yeah. you know, is it going to be I about on, online? Uh, you know, the online space is another whole thing for another whole yeah. thing. I, I, want to, yeah. I want to intervene. I want to intervene because no, I think okay. one of the... One of the things that we encountered in the visual century, or I did certainly, because I am not an academic. I don't have a degree. I don't have a PhD. I have a degree, but not a PhD. And there's this kind of formalism of academia that says, in order to, to publish anything serious like a history book, you have to have a PhD. Well, I don't, but I have published a history book now. Uh, so that contradicts that, that whole academic uh, almost rule that exists. And we came across this absurdity with the academic side of the publishing house, who Witz is an academic publisher, that they could only publish something that had been peer reviewed. And this was absurd because the only people who could peer review it, in other words, the, 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 art, the, the art historians who had the know-how to peer review what we had produced were all included in the book. So we could not actually peer review it from a South African standpoint, we had to find international reviewers to actually have a look at what we had done to say, okay, is this a good piece of writing? Is this a good piece of history? We do not understand the details because we are not that expert in some other countries' uh, uh, historical timelines, but we agree this is a good, this is a very, all the peer reviews that came back were excellent. So the question is, what is academia actually doing by preventing publishing happening when there is this kind of academic umbrella that almost dictates who can write and where you can publish and, and you get points or something for being an academic uh, person who has you know, a, a, a text in some major uh, recognizable academic review. That's not how the world works today. The world is completely different. We publish everywhere. We go to seminars, we go to lectures, we give Zoom talks, people publish them on. That's also publishing. It's the exchange of information that's important, not academic standards. So I think this is a question that really is a problem still today and will continue to be a problem as long as academia feels they have the authority to kind of control what is being said historically because they're the only people who somehow know the truth. And that's not true at all in the real world. And, and, and I think, you know, Kevin, it, it, in, in these days, it's actually less about uh, the truth and it's more around the commodification of, of that knowledge. And so, of course, the firewalls behind that. Lisa, I think, you know, in some of our discussions, um, you know, we, 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 we've talked about the importance of open access um, and open access publishing. Um, I'm going to come back to that. I just wanted to read from the comments from yes, the participants. Please. <laughs> um, and then I'll come back to you, Lisa. Uh, but uh, Linda Mbusi says, thanks, Gavin and Mario, for your honesty about the problematic publisher. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the second part of it. It says my question or it's something about Selby Mbusi to Wits University Press remains my, remains my most exquisitely rude to force the action. So I'm not sure what that means, but perhaps, Linda, you could rewrite that for us. Marian, you say, I've just retired. I'm now free to write from a more interdisciplinary and autoethnographic angle without institutional pressure to produce academic texts to be appraised for funding, right? So, and again, this link between, um, you know, publishing and funding. Um, Philippa, you're saying formal academic qualifications uh, have resulted in a massive loss of information. Uh, part of the process in transforming the published landscape needs to rewrite this um, uh, so-called requirement, right? So again, it's important in terms, you know, to think about who, who can write, who writes and, and, and for whom. Um, Lisa, can we come back to you on some of the reflections in terms of getting us to embrace open access publishing? Because I think that 
is an important thing because here we have something that is very valuable. Um, it's a recorder of the, of the, you know, complex politics, um, you know, between the, those decades. Mm. Um, and yet it's not accessible, um, you know, people can't find it. So what are your thoughts on, on open access and embracing it um, as academics, as thinkers, whether we're in, inside or out, operating outside institutions? Um, I, you look, it's a labor of love, I think. Uh, we, between a rock and a hard place as academics, we have to publish and we have to publish in accredited journals in order to get subsidization. Uh, if we don't get subsidization and literally money into our research accounts, we can't go to conferences, we can't buy ourselves out of incredibly busy teaching schedules, and we can't then do any, any further publishing. So, so it, it, it becomes a kind of double bind. I try and do both. Uh, I think that publishing in open access is a bit of a labor of love, but it absolutely has to happen. Um, you know, one, one is one is caught in such a kind of conundrum as an academic. You know, if you, I'm, I'm writing a monograph at the moment. You know, I've, I've had an offer from a, a big uh, publisher-based uh, uh, university um, uh, abroad in the UK, a very well-known publisher. If you accept that, which is a kind of feather in your cap, and it, you know, you, you're going to get it broadly distributed by that publisher and well distributed abroad, uh, local people don't get to read it, and the book is too expensive to buy even for yourself. You know, if you if you get your free copy, that's all you can all you can count on. You're not going to be able to afford to buy one yourself. Um, and you know, even the journals in which you publish for free, the the subsidised journals, if you had to go and buy your own article, you couldn't afford to buy it. So the whole publishing industry, as you say, the commodification of it is actually odious. It's completely ridiculous, and like universities are also um, enthralled to. It. You know, they pay enormous amounts of money in order to, to uh, have these journals um, available to their own academics who actually write the article and the material. So these publishing houses like Springer, etc., who make an absolute fortune out of their, their, their journals that, that are produced online, that doesn't cost anything to produce anymore. They get the editors for free, who do it as a labor of academic love for their CVs. They get the writers for free. It's, a, they, it's easy to distribute on an academic network who pay a fortune for it. It's a completely absurd situation. So the only way to do this is to take publishing in our own hands and go for open access online publishing to free ourselves from this absurd exploitation, really, and, and the perpetuation of a completely elite readership. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Mario, I mean, I think some of the initiatives where, you know, we've mentored young writers and publishing online without those restrictions is, is one such example. And you did sort of briefly, you know, touch on the two publications that are coming up. But what are your views in terms of, you know, thinking about the, the publication, not just publication, but producing and generating knowledge and bringing in more people and, this, and the significance of mentorship um, within that process, right? So, and, and, and working with, uh, you know, experimenting with different ways of publishing, you know, creative publications, not just in terms of working online, but, you know, engaging with different ways in which we can disseminate things, disseminate um, our writing. Uh, but yeah, maybe can you say a little bit more about mentorship? Look, um, you know, on one hand, I always feel it's a little arrogant to sort of claim that I'm playing a mentoring role because, you know, I always feel like I'm still learning. Generally, I'm finding that um, probably about, 60, 70%, maybe sometimes more than that, of the contributions we get do require a lot of toing and froing, going backwards and forwards, pushing people. What are you trying to say here? This idea is not very clear to me. You know, um, and, and, and again, you know, that's kind of, it's quite intense work because it can really take ages before some pieces, you know, actually get to be published. Um, the fees we're offering are, are quite modest. Uh, you can't insist on somebody dropping everything. You've got to be sensitive to the fact that they're trying to stay alive and are doing you know, multiple freelance things at the same time. Um, but you also still, I think we're also starting to build, um, I don't want to say a community in a, in a fixed or defined way, 
but quite a, 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 a reasonable mess, if not necessarily a critical mess, of writers that are, are, are coming back and are producing more texts for us. Uh, and it's growing, it's expanding all the time. And so I think it was a good shift on our part. And I think this is a learning from visual century. The, this idea of, of, of commissioning writers, you know, deciding that, okay, we need text on. Now let's put out a call and let's see who responds. So some of the time we do approach people directly, but a lot of the time it's just people coming from that I don't even know who they are. And because I'm not actually directly involved in university work, you know, I, I don't know often that somebody's really happening. I don't know who they are. I just get this name. I look at the, what they're proposing as an angle because I always ask people to that. People must have an angle. They can't just want to write on something. So as soon as I see that there's an idea there, then one can actually work with that. So it's, it's very encouraging, I think, um, to see more and more people that are, are, are coming through. And uh, I think, you know, Nomusa, Lisa, you, you're dealing with this very practically because, you know, you, you, a lot of your students of this generation that are, are coming through now that are really interested in, in art history, in visual culture studies, um, you know, in, in art and society, in social change. It's, it's, an, it's a complete different generation from someone like myself who, you know, thinks back to the 80s for those debates. I mean, they're locating all of that now with all the changing technology and everything. Um, I mean, I feel like a dinosaur in all of this very often. So it's very nice to be working with young people who are, have actually got their fingers on the pulse. I, I want to pick up on that. I want to pick up on that. Uh, yeah, I want to pick up on that idea of using contemporary digital technology and the idea that Lisa raised about self-publishing uh, and getting out from under the orthodoxy of the established publishing houses and publishing systems. Um, I'm thinking of... Uh, um, um, Art 21, that produced this series of, uh, well, they were initially podcasts, but then all made television, which are then distributed as podcasts. And I'm thinking if one could perhaps make a, a version of that, um, where you're not necessarily relying on text, um, but actually on, we are in the visual field. Uh, we are in the multidisciplinary visual field and whether, digital technology doesn't offer us better opportunities for the dissemination of information uh, that people don't have to pay for in this exuberant, you know, what's the name of um, buying a book for 400, 600, whatever rands, but actually just being able to watch it on their phone on the bus going into, going into work or going into college or whatever you, whatever going to school, that if there isn't that sort of response to instead of publishing a fifth volume of Visual Century, perhaps making a series of podcasts or whatever, visual podcasts, uh, video podcasts, that actually is commissioned and invites people to work with us because you, you, you can do something very simple, just an iPhone. The, the actual audio technology and, 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 and digital recording technology on, the, on an iPhone is so superb that you could actually make a product with this very simple, very complex tool if you know just the basics about how to use a, an editing program, a video editing program, which still means you have to have, as Mario says, a good idea, and you have to have somebody who has some kind of textual basis to make that, formulate that good idea so that it can be turned into something like a podcast. It could also be an audio podcast if necessary. But I just think that alternative of open-ended open publication where you are no longer relying on the publishing houses to do the picture research and all of that, that you actually sit down and work with a group of artists or a group of historians or an artist, singular, to produce something that disseminates a different view and a new view version or a contribution to the extension of history that is important in the same way that we were trying to do it with the old methods of hardback publishing uh, in uh, 2011, when we launched Visual Century. Because I think that for me, if we had been able to uh, apply the digital technology that I knew and I was working with in Norway at the time, uh, you know, 
the entire design process of visual sensory was done between myself sitting in Oslo at night after I've come from work, talking to the designer who was in Cape Town or I don't know where he was sitting actually, but, but we shared a program in which we could look at the designs daily. Every, uh, every set or every chapter we would go through night by night, we'd go through chapter by chapter. This took like almost a year, uh, literally of extra work in the evenings, but we did it digitally and I was sitting on the other end of, other, other end of the world. So I think that this technology provides us with a superb opportunity to get out from under this um, particular, um, you know, dominance of the of the old publishing establishment and and finding an alternative because they are certainly not doing it they are not willing to take this on but i think uh, an organization such as society who had the funding the support funding to do it could actually produce something like this and maybe some of the universities could themselves they have the technology university of cape town has a film department where there's some pe people who know how to write a script and could actually put this together so I think that that is something we should uh, consider. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention as we are celebrating the visual, the 10th anniversary of this book is to have, to get some feedback on, uh, from people who have used it, who have used this book and how they have the, gained any benefits from having this book. Uh, in their library or in their schools or in their universities or in their research centers, just to find out whether some of the goals we had set ourselves when we started this project, whether some of those goals have been actually attained. And I don't know if there are, I can't see the, the question list, but maybe some, um, some of the participants uh, would like to uh, give us their opinion on the value or the problems they've had with the book. Um, just to acknowledge that we've temporarily lost Namosa to load shedding. Uh, she did say she'd be able to come back with the data, yeah, so hopefully we will see her soon. Um, I think, Gavin, thank, thanks for, for foregrounding that. And I think that certainly, you know, you are exemplary in that, you know, I'm younger than you, but, I, you know, you, you're much younger than me in terms of actually <laughs> being in tune with what, you know, technology can can do and it is something that we, we have been you know thinking about and I think that the the podcast idea also works incredibly well for getting artists to talk about their work um, not that all artists want to talk about their work but yeah. we, we I mean this has always been an issue that uh, you know artists are, produce important work that you know we can write about sorry to make that distinction between us and them but I'm thinking of when you've got your writer's hat on, you know, somebody's work is important. So you, you spend all the time on researching them, making sense of their work, et cetera. Sorry, I've been told not to shake, wave my hands around, but uh, it's, a, it's a, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what, but uh, it's, it's always been an issue. Um, so the thing is that, you know, that, that, that's a form that artists, you know, can really talk uh, about their work and that it's really good. But I also mm -hmm. want to say that, you know, while we have we have to work on every platform because the book the old book still has a value and a currency mm -hmm. and it's not just a conservative value it's as you know it's, it's, it's a very different experience if i can just share one practical example we spent a lot of uh, we did a lot of work on lionel davis's archive and you know we published we photographed his work we published it online uh, you know, all these press clips, everything. We had done this for over a few years. Nobody even noticed. Then he had an exhibition at the National Gallery, which was curated by the District 6 Museum in partnership with us. We focused on the book. They focused on the exhibition. We did this book, which in a sense was like a little mini visual century, but on Lionel Davis, all these commissioned texts looking at different themes in his work. Um, and suddenly, what that did for him in terms of people starting to take him seriously as an artist, you know, we couldn't achieve that same impact uh, online. So I think, you know, it's about using different, different platforms, but yeah. I also just want to just 
briefly let's respond here to Bernadette von Hauter's comment here about have we approached Brits to negotiate an alternative form of publication? Most publishers are open to ebooks, etc. Uh, I'm aware that that's written into the original contract. And to be honest, I have problems with it. Because again, who is going to purchase the ebook? I think the publisher has made money from the project. And I think that it's now time for that information to be made more accessible. I mean, I've never bought an ebook in my life. I'm not going to start now. Um, but okay, I'm not the target audience, perhaps. But I really think that it's 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 a very simple thing to do. Um, I actually have the PDFs of all the chapters uh, on my computer. Uh, could literally upload them in an hour or two. So I think this is a conversation that we need to have with this. Um, you know, the book now, ten years later, um, one thousand copies of the box set were produced. Um, there's about 150 left. I think we're helping sell them right now. Um, and there's been a number of events where we've been pushing it online with the site. It's, it's selling. Uh, there's no problem with the rest of those books being sold. Um, where where so can I you buy that, this? Where can you buy these books? Visual Century. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, from where you are, it's incredibly difficult because of the cost of postage. The book weighs, as you know, four and a half kilos. And I, I, I did a little bit of promotion with it online. And I had people from Brazil to the UK, the Netherlands, uh, Botswana, all over the place requesting copies from me. By the time I sent them quotes for postage, they had all backed off because the, the postage was three, four times the cost of the book. So it, this, this is a practical problem with the, with the, with the distribution of, of, of the book. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to. So you gone again? I think we've she lost came you. back and she. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to find out from 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 Lisa. I mean, this this idea of actually creating um, an alternative form of publication of releasing. I would rather call it releasing information into the public sphere using contemporary technology and contemporary technological distribution systems. This is what I think is one. I agree with Mario that we need both, but I think if we did the first one, which was maybe freely or very cheaply accessible, it would lead to people wanting to gain the hard copy publishing. The one, they are not, they are not disconnected, but I think if I have seen a great video about somebody uh, or a great podcast about of somebody's work or a piece of history that I don't know, and I know there is a publication, I may want to acquire that. And I think the one leads to the other. I think these two things are interconnected. They're not totally separate, but I, I, I'd want to find out how does, how does academia respond to this? Because they certainly would have the tools to initiate things like this. They'd certainly have the money to initiate things like this. I don't see why this is not happening. Just to Lisa. <laughs> uh, to me, ooh, I don't know how to address this, um, <laughs> uh, Gavin, I really don't. Um, yeah, well, you know, I suppose if one actually went to one's university and, and proposed something like that and um, really launched it and had the will to launch it as a project and go fundraising the way that Mario is, is sort of so dedicated to fundraising for a side that, that, that it would be possible to do something like that. But again, I want to emphasize that that would be a labor of love. You know, we are under enormous pressure to publish or perish and um, encouraged to publish in accredited journals. Yeah, and, you know, and it's part of a part of that system. And it's 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 very hard to sort of get the performance ratings that you need and to actually launch projects like this and do them. So it's 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 a kind of a juggling of, of various priorities that one has as an academic. But I think that it's the kind of project that would have to be, I think, launched by a number of people. You know, there has to be the will, such as uh, the will to get Visual Century done, which was kind of driven by you and then really implemented again, orchest orchestrated by Mario. Um, but, you know, it's a conversation that we should all have. Everyone here who, who backs the idea of something like this. I personally love the idea of podcasts. 
I think it's a totally brilliant idea. Um, it's inexpensive and I don't think it would be an enormous amount of extra work and it could be fun, a fun project. Fun, it's project. fun for the students to listen to, I, find I, the spoken word easier than the written word. This yeah. generation. I want to come back to this, this thing about the recognized journal that writers and researchers should not fear this issue of the recognized journal because you get, I have never been limited in any way by any academic institution from publishing or writing for. I write and I publish wherever there is space. Everyone wants to uh, 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 release this into the public domain. I don't have anybody sitting on my back telling me that I have to do it to the recognized journal. And that leads to more invitations to do more research and to do more publishing. This is why I had the confidence to do Visual Century because I did not, I was just shocked that Ritz came to us and said, this has to be peer reviewed. I had never had anything peer reviewed in my life. I had comments and I had criticism from individuals and from other historians and from other people in the art world. But to, to say that this limited me to what I could say that there was this peer review that actually gave it some form of credit as if they had no, there was nothing of value until it had been peer reviewed is, is slightly absurd. It's a leftover from the past where academia felt it had to rule on everything. And, and it doesn't anymore because I can go to the web, I can go on Google, I can go on WhatsApp and find everything I need today. I don't have to go to an academic publication. Yes, I may not have the qualifications in that, if I was using it to get a university degree, but if I just wanted the information, the information is there. Yeah, Gavin, I think that it's a thing that universities are very interested in the ratings, that they global ratings and the academic credibility depends on quality control. And these kind of peer reviews are demanded uh, by um, accredited journals with reputations, academic reputations. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of in game, you know, that all, all universities um, uh, in a way are compelled to play. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon individual academics to find alternatives. Uh, we have to play that particular game, but you can also, as I say, um, do open access, a more a passionate kind of projects um, mm -hmm. As well, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be either or. It just puts yeah. pressure on us, on the academics, on the on the ground. Yeah, agreed. Who's with us? We still have some fifty people participating. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, raise respond to you. This in volume five. Um, I, I must say, I, I, I do. It is an idea that's growing on me. I've often thought about. You know, could, should it should the book be reprinted? You know, and and to be honest with you, and just honest with everybody, I've never been entirely sure about that. And I and, and I'm going to be brutally frank here. I, I don't think Volume Four is very successful for a number of reasons. I, I don't want to elaborate too much here, but it's the one volume that actually doesn't follow the guidelines. Um, you know. The writers had certain uh, guidelines that editors were expected to uh, communicate. For example, we're not profiling an individual artist. We're dealing with a theme. Select a work from an artist and select, you know, up to eight works from, from different artists. You'll find, you know, there's chapters that are almost doing the same job. Um, so yeah, for me, it's always been quite um, a patchy, a patchy production. Um, I mean, there's three editors' names on it in terms of trying to get it up to a decent standard at the end. I think one and two, and obviously I'm biased with three. Uh, so for me, it's always been one, the fact that I, I personally think the project is quite uneven in the quality. But secondly, you know, that maverick time frame does make it a bit awkward um, in terms of now what are you doing by retaining this 1907 to 2007. But if you were just to build on it, and um, actually say, well, we're at, an, at, an, at a good point now to maybe rewind the last, I mean, I'm just randomly selecting a number 20, 25 years, 30 years, uh, and look at what's been happening. I think that could be an interesting publication where you use the similar approach, where a group of people sat down, 
and discussed, okay, from the thematic point of view, what have been the most relevant themes? And then identify the writers for that um, and produce that, maybe even just in, in digital form. Um, but well, you know, we could actually raise the money for that fairly easily. Um, I mean, it, it throws the box set out the window because we're not talking about trying to fit that fifth one into that box set. But just as a concept, um, I'm, I'm interested whether did you just dream this up today? Is it something you've been thinking about for a while? I dreamed it up today. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot. Listen, um, yes, I'm, I'm not for, for publishing more hard copies. I, I saw that Bernadette van Aute also, and I agree with her, said that students today use ebooks. You know, they don't actually visit the, the library um, much. They want, want the books accessible as ebooks. I do think that there's a good point to be made, a good argument to be made to, to get Vits to, to release it as an ebook and possibly a, a drastically uh, discounted preferably a totally open access ebook that that would be first prize you know so i think that we can appeal to them to do that um i do think that there's there's a need for that still i get very excited when i see someone like funzo hi funzo saying that you know that they, they use it a lot at the at, at tut um and theo sonicus as well who mentioned that that it's he's used it extensively in his teaching um, but I am actually very keen on precisely this younger generation of which Funzo and Theo, and I see Anami Conradi is there. I think of Palesa Mukwena, I think of Ati Georgia. I, I would love to see a new volume coming out with more of these young, fresh voices um, bringing their incredible research that they've done for their PhDs into, into a, a new volume. Maybe a, not a supplementary volume, but companion volumes, a new, a new set that's available as an ebook. Yeah, I, I, would, I think it's a brilliant idea. Okay. I'm looking at a, a question that's come in from Philippa Duncan and says, have the authors of the original chapters been approached to create seminars around their contributions? And I was wondering, could this not be could this not be the first set of podcasts where you bring in young researchers to work with the writers who, who, may, who wrote the texts for the 36 writers who wrote the texts for the original books and get them to engage with each other in some form of seminar or questionnaire or Zoom uh, broadcast such as this where they talk about what, what their aims were and how that is perceived by a contemporary new generation of researchers and writers. That I think would also, and would, would also, for example, Mario, your issue of the fourth volume, which we all realized was a difficult one to finalize, uh, that there's a, there's a lot that could be said right there that you could expand those questions into to those, because like I say, there are 36 writers. And if we were to do that just as, a uh, single 40-minute uh, podcast, that's a, that's a project for the next year for us. <laughs> there's, a, there's a constructive contribution. So I don't know if that answers Philippa's question. I am back in. Good. Hi. <laughs> we can see a still image of you, but you are not live. So, <laughs> and I've made most of the discussion. <laughs> okay. And my, my, but I, I mean, I guess just following uh, onto this, uh, you know, question around whether you get younger people to work with the original writers. I mean, I think that there's, there's, there's a, there's a kind of differentiation that can be made in terms of the interests of. Um, the scholars that we have now. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I think Lisa, the point that you had made earlier about the interest in contemporary art should be of retrieval of knowledges um, that people are finding in archives, that people are finding, you know, in, in archival research. Um, and so what I think would actually be nice is, is, is to have, you know, have something that's a publication that's more about the conversations that are developing. Um, and so what, what, what you have is less of a response, but 
uh, you know, like uh, conversations that arise out of um, the project of the visual century. So I might be speaking of, of turn clearly because I, I haven't heard everything that was said. Um, but I think, yeah, what is exciting is, is this possibility of um, an accessible, accessible publishing. Um, uh, and then I see, oh, I see Philip has just um, put in a question there, but I think maybe, maybe Gavin carry on as you were, because I think you may have more uh, of the, uh, you have no, you, you, you probably now, because you caught the, the conversation and I left the conversation, I'm now mm -hmm. a little bit, <laughs> it I feels a little bit uh, lost mm -hmm. in terms of, yeah. No, it was, it was just that um, this issue of, is there a possibility to move forward? Um, I, uh, I, I would love to see something come forward. I, I don't necessarily think <laughs> it's going to happen with this publishing house that we are concerned with. I think there's a great difficulty there, but I think it's worth a try. We should, we should at least attempt it. But if not, I mean, um, grab, grab the nettle right now and um, address it through technology. The new technologies give us a, a, a massive advantage. Um, you know, if you, if you just think about what television was like 20 years ago, where to get anything on television was, um, you know, it was like climbing a mountain or climbing Mount Everest. If you, if you had no experience with working in, in the television in, uh, industry or making a television film or even just making a film, you couldn't participate in that. Today, everybody releases their, their home videos via the internet. Uh, so the relevance of television has declined significantly. Uh, there's a greater variety on, 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 on YouTube uh, and uh, accessibility on, on platforms such as YouTube to get information about art and art history that uh, is bound up in academic journals elsewhere that you will never access because the academic journals just circulated within those academic circles. And you need to get out of those academic circles into the real world and make this information available. So um, thinking constructively around projects that could be initiated in the same way that visual sensory was a kind of challenge to this publishing world that they just did not know what to do with this. They had never seen a history book written with 36 different voices in it and four different editors. Uh, they were confused by this and lots of publishers simply wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. So I think that this, um, this sort of new alternative, uh, it was already there 10 years ago. When I published my very first book, I made a very similar presentation to my then institute in London saying, let's make a book that is followed by a web page and followed by a series of podcasts. And they just never understood it then. This was 20 years ago uh, and it never happened, but I did publish the book. That was my first, my first book. Um, and I never ever developed the web page for it. I couldn't afford it because I literally funded a book out of my own private money to get outside of the publishing network. That's what I had to do. And this is like you say, a labor of love. If you have that labor of love and you want to do this, you will find a way to do it. Money or no money, you will find a way to do it. So I think that the challenge is there for all young researchers, all young groups of researchers who feel coming together will strengthen their hand and make it uh, make an, uh, an initiative possible. Go for it. There's nothing that stops you from going for it. Just do it and put it out there and see what the results bring you. I think that's the challenge. Yeah, just uh, while Gavin uh, correctly is, you know, coming with a very visionary perspective on, on technology, um, this dinosaur is going back to the book. Um, <laughs> and yes, as I've said, we need all, all the platforms. But I think one of the big challenges that you know, we just need to acknowledge as well is the, the question of distribution um, when it comes to print books. Because you know, I think what happened with Visual Century as well was that, uh, as I recall, the distributor approached uh, Exclusive. And my understanding is that Exclusive is not only a monopoly, but you know, what goes with being a monopoly is 
a bullying culture. And that, uh, if I recall what, what we were told anyway, it was that they, they wanted the price, the book at a, at a radically reduced price, um, which at the time didn't seem reasonable at all. And, you know, exclusive never stopped for your century. Um, you have to go to the counter and ask for it. And the first few months, I was in, constantly in a state of shock. Um, Gavin mentioned the international launches we were doing. You know, I would expect to see the book at, at the exclusive at the airport. And I'd find a bigger book on art than, than visual symmetry, but on Western art or something. I mean, this is a real case. And I was like, you know, so it's not about weighing too much for someone to carry on the plane, um, but that they probably got for next to nothing, uh, some remainder or something that they've dressed up now and, you know, put a huge markup on. Um, and the, the thing that we've really struggled with our publications has been that, you know, the network of independent bookstores book is so small. And in fact, it's not a network. Uh, it's so fragmented. Um, and just, it's incredibly difficult um, to get stuff out there. But in our instance, because we're not a commercial publisher, you know, we also do distribute a lot of books for free. So for example, to get books into libraries, uh, into schools. But even through that, we have to work through existing structures, which are often quite dysfunctional on their own. So that, that remains the one, um, the one challenge. But, you know, with the Lionel Davis book, you know, we, we actually printed, you know, uh, 1,300 copies, which is actually what Visual Century printed. Visual Century did 1,000 box sets and then 300 singular. Um, we still have 600. Uh, this is a book that we published in um, 2017. Um, so we've done fairly well. But we've also made each one of those chapters you can actually download for free. Because, you know, going back to this point of how the two reinforce each other, which what Gavin was saying, you know, if you don't have the money, you'll put it on your computer. But if you have the means and you have the option to buy the book, you'll buy the book because it's another experience. So, you know, the two just work, uh, work very well together. And I think one has to constantly um, be utilizing all those platforms. I do think that hosting uh, digital stuff can be actually become quite expensive. Um, it is a, a bit of a challenge that we are facing with the site, with the videos and video sizes and uploading videos. Um, <clears throat> there's also the software you need for editing, etc. So I'm not saying this is an excuse not to do it, but it does require a bit of an investment. It does require some training. Um, it does require some resourcefulness. But obviously, it is um, it is a, a very um, advantageous medium to use, um, especially if you can't ship your books because of the price. Um, with the, Against the Grain, um, what we did was through the Smithsonian, we shipped 180 books to Washington. And they then shipped those books back to Africa to about 120 or 140 libraries across the continent. I mean, it was totally insane that we had to take that route um, but they could do it. They had the budget to do it um, as part of the Akasa book distribution program. So Janice Stanley, you know, took care of that. Um, but we can't get books even to Botswana. It's, it's a problem. It's ridiculous. Okay. Oh. We've been at it for an hour and a half. Are there any more questions? I I don't see any questions in the Q and A, um, and I don't see any in the chat. Um, I'm not sure, Julie. Have you received any on your side? Um, I'm very no, much aware I, that because I, I uh, haven't seen more questions than uh, what you've read from the chat. There was only one in the Q and A. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, what, what is interesting is um, hearing, of course, uh, not just some of the challenges, but I mean, there is some sort of sense of pessimism in terms of what is possible, but also uh, on the other hand, there is some kind of optimism um, in terms of how we could possibly make the work of visual century something that doesn't begin and end um, in one place, right? And we can continue 
um, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of how we develop the, the art writing and research in, in, in South Africa, but not just in South Africa, of course, across the boundaries. And again, I mean, I think once we begin to think about that, thinking across national boundaries, we begin to realize that a lot of our artists, of course, much of their production has so much to do with those collaborations. And so the writing and research that we do the and the institutions that we work with, of course, we have to begin to look across um, the, the, the boundaries. Uh, so it's not just South Africa, but of course, our uh, you know, the rest of the, the continent, but I guess all the other links um, and, and, and places of contact and exchange that artists in South Africa have, 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 um, have um, uh, in, 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 in enlivened. Um, Linda Mvusi says, internet platforms enable the primacy of artists' voices directly outside of academia's othering and peripheralizing. Um, there's value in visiting artist studios, including artists' voices, not just analysts, in, in the contemporary and transdisciplinary um, dialogue. I fully agree uh, in terms of that. It allows um, for us to do much more. Um, but also, of course, we can't uh, leave these institutions untouched. <laughs> and I think we probably have to do the work of changing how they operate and changing, um, you know, this this sort of uh, alienated and isolated uh, modes of, of of producing knowledge. Um, but I don't know if maybe perhaps you may have some responses to Linda's comment. Um, any of our panelists? I I would say that Linda is, is completely correct in her analysis. I think I the best way to confront these monopolies of publishing is to create alternatives that beat them financially because that's the only language they really truly understand. If they, if they no longer can produce 5,000 copies because they run the risk of only selling 2,000, then they will do it, not do it. Uh, so I think that if you produce, if you produce alternative bits of inf historical information online, uh, uh, that is either free or easily accessible uh, to scholars and students and artists who are interested in this and broaden that, the, 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 the reception of that information. I think at the end of the day, the institutions, these established publishing houses will have to take notice. They have already done that in, in, certainly in the European sphere with other forms of publication. If you look at what's happening to music publication, if you look at what's happening to film and video publication, uh, uh, you see it's already happening there. The monopolies are all broken up. They've all lost out. They no longer can dictate to, 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 a, young, to a younger generation. This is definitely the way to go. And I think that uh, the important bit is having the good ideas because it's the good ideas that make the good products and the good products then do their own thing. And I think that visual century was a relatively good idea. And I think that's one of the reasons it has uh, this kind of response that uh, we are getting from it. Uh, Mario, I don't know if you had a response to that as well. I mean, the internet can have its pitfalls as well. It's not always yeah. accessible. I, I mean, I'm sitting here <laughs> struggling to connect to the conversation because of the internet. So it may not always hold all the answers, mm -hmm. but I don't know, maybe Mario and then Lisa. <laughs> yeah, look, um, I, I think that one of the things that happened for me with Visual Century was, you know, I also kind of very quickly lost faith in the idea of working with an academic press. Um, and that's also why uh, the publications that we've done as a side, we've done ourselves. Because it just seemed like, you know, you do all the work and then you hand it over to somebody else. And ultimately, the issue is distribution. You know, um, you know Gavin's spoken about the peer review. It wasn't just that. I mean, Bits also produced an editor. And, you know, with no disrespect to the individual who's, you know, particularly good at what she does, but it really seemed totally bizarre to us. We'd gone through such a thorough editing process 
and suddenly, you know, we had to have the approved editor. Um, so I think that, you know, that that degree of ownership of your product and just feeling like, you know, you actually want to have more control on it. Um, okay, you know, so we're not working from a, a commercial basis, but, and we, you know, we have to raise money for our projects. But I, I think that that was a, definitely one of the things that I, I, I personally learned from Visual Central. Like I'm not, I'm not going to approach anybody with a manuscript. Uh, I understand that it can be prestigious. It can be all sorts of things. But, you know, as, has been, as Lisa was highlighting, you know, you can't even afford a copy of your own book. Uh, whereas if you produce it yourself, you can actually give it to everybody that you know actually needs it and you know, might not even be able to pay for it. Um, and it's good to sell some on the side too. But we are still ultimately up against that challenge in terms of distribution. And I think that's where uh, one has to plug into different events. I mean, we did the Cape Town Art Book Fair at the end of last year um, that at Norval Foundation, and that was actually quite successful for us. And it's something we're looking at at the moment is, is how do we actually engage with art book fairs um, and also art fairs um, and try and plug into some of these events and, that, and move, them, move some of our, our our books, you know, um, that, that way. But but certainly just to repeat the, the point that I started on, I think I, I personally learned a lot from working on the project. Uh, I think it's it's it might not be calling itself Visual Century, but I've adapted uh, what I learned and it's 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 coming forward in, in, in the work that we're doing through SI. So um, yeah, I mean there, there are ways of perhaps the project in with that brand Visual Century going forward. Um, it's another whole conversation whether it was a good name. We never had that conversation because Gavin came with that and came with the funding and it was like, okay, well, we got that. Because um, I've often thought it sounds more like visual culture studies, the, the title, but I'm opening a whole new debate here. Um, so yes, there might be a volume five. I think I do like the idea. Um, maybe it's a conversation we should uh, continue and see whether there isn't a way of doing it. Whether we should do it with, with the same publisher, I, I, I would need a lot of persuasion as to what the benefit of that would be apart from handing over something to somebody else to make the money. Um, because we can raise the money for the design, we can raise the money for the digitization, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I'd, 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 I think I'll end on, 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 on that point. It was very productive in total um, and a lot of lessons learned, um, some good, some could have been better. I think I want to end by actually acknowledging that despite all our initial doubts and all the difficulties that the, the book has had, I, I am just, uh, and even the, the distribution difficulties, uh, et cetera, I'm just uh, thrilled by how many people enjoyed it, how many people uh, are still using it today uh, in their teaching, in their own personal research, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that... Uh, one of the great um, moments of Im immediately after the launch of Visual Century was a letter we got from Nadine Godema uh, at the time we're still alive saying that this was the best thing that had happened in the last five years of her life or something like that. And that she kept a copy of the book on her coffee table in her living room for every one of her vis visitors to see. Uh, so visual century has had that kind of effect on people, and that has been part of the part of the uh, distribution of it, uh, or information about it, or public relations about it, that people present it to others and say, "Look at this. This is worth getting, and even if you can't afford it, it's worth trying to read it if you can get a copy at your library, or if it was on on the internet, it would be superb." So I think this is. A positive from it that with all our expectations with all the disappointments etc cetera, etc cetera, it has managed to achieve uh, quite a large percentage of what we set out for it to, to achieve south africa has uh, a history book that presents an alternative history um, and uh, i'm sure there are artists who feel they should have been part of it and i'm sure there are artists who feel they don't want anything to do with it for whatever reason, that's okay. Um, that's how history books go. That's how history books are managed. Um, history is not given and factually fixed once the printing presses stop on this publication. 
it continues, research on this work will continue. And I would certainly want to invite every researcher, every young researcher to go ahead, find the information, do the work, do the thinking, do the looking, and come up with some new information and provide that information to as broad a community as you possibly can. That would extend visual century beyond the 10 years we have enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you. And Lisa, closing remarks? I have nothing to add, Namusa. Thank you for hosting this so graciously. And um, it was fun, it was, it was really nice. And especially for the visitors who, who all responded in the chat box, much appreciated and nice to see so many names of people I know. Absolutely, absolutely. And also to thank you as panelists, um, Gavin, Lisa, thank you so much for, for just giving us your insights and to thank Tulile and Mario for, for organizing this. Um, we really do appreciate, and I think a space like this to discuss this particular project um, was very much necessary. Um, but yes, uh, in much gratitude um, and also to all the participants. And with that, um, we can close. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. 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 <laughs>